A big welcome to everybody. And uh, some of you know this uh, Buddhist studies series that we do at Common Ground Meditation Center. It's actually a six year curriculum. Most of the courses are eight weeks, but depending on the time of the year, it can be anywhere between six and eight weeks. We're basically going through the different maps that the Buddha used as best as we can understand um, to share what he had come to understand about his own mind. And there's no real beginning or end to the six year curriculum. So people are coming in and out. I recognize some of you who've probably done at least one, if not two loops of those of that six year curriculum. And this winter, we're going to be starting um, four courses on the four foundations of mindfulness. So the winter course is mindfulness of the body. And uh, I think it was Bhikkhu Bodhi, this uh, American Buddhist monk who's done so much tremendous translation over the many decades. He's now somewhat retired living in the United States, to, can, also as a monk. Um, but I think the way he described these different maps, these lists, these teachings from the Buddha as a kind of uh, the, in the early years of uh, aerial photography, when they were sort of mapping out the topography of a particular place, you know, they take a lot of aerial photographs, but no one photograph completely lines up with the other photographs. So you kind of lay them out see where they meet and you get the lay of the land. And that was the image he used for these different maps that the Buddha used in teaching. You may not know this, but the Buddha wandered in Northern India for 45 years after his awakening teaching. So that's a lot of years and a lot of different people that he came into contact with each time that particular, those particular people, that particular situation, it would draw out of him some teaching. You know, he wasn't trying to uh, say the same thing. He was trying to be mindful, right? To be intimate in the moment. So exactly what he said really arose freshly in that moment. And so over those 45 years, there were a number of different maps or teachings that the Buddha shared. And mindfulness of the body is one of the more central teachings. And I'm looking forward to having this time to, for my own practice. And I'm, I'm hoping too, I'm, I'm pretty confident that it will be useful. But uh, the way the Buddha studies classes are set up, you know, the responsibility really lies with each of us we're here, you'll be hearing some information. Hopefully you'll have some time to do some study. Even in the email I sent out this afternoon, I'm assuming that the people who haven't been in the course got that email, but I'll resend it tomorrow when we've integrated people who have just registered for the first time into the Buddhist studies email list. So if you didn't get my email that was sent out maybe around I don't know, maybe 4.30 or so, um, thereabouts. But then you'll get it again tomorrow. And there are some resources to read. And eventually I'll get out um, a whole web page of both suttas, discourses from the time of the Buddha, but also some articles by contemporary teachers. And, uh, you know, some people will do a lot of study, some people less study, but the idea is to do our formal practice where we're in a way leaving the teachings behind and doing a more direct and immediate exploration awareness of the body. But the study that we do will inform that direct practice. And so that's really what makes this a Buddhist studies class. We're specifically using these pointing out instructions from the Buddha in our direct practice of meditation, but it may not be sitting meditation. It could be, and especially with mindfulness of the body, 
and then we'll cover this tonight after the sit. It's really bad to be mindfulness all day long of all of our bodily activities. And I'll explain that more later. And the last thing I just wanna mention that's really central to this um, practice is that, and it, it kind of brings some sincerity every other week. So week two, week four, week six and week eight, we'll save the last 20 or 25 minutes and we'll break into small groups. And there's, you know, I can't make you stay for the small groups. And, you know, some of you introverts or whatever, you may not want to stay for the small groups, but I really encourage people to stay because there's something about being in a relatively small group, three or four people, and just feeling responsible to share what you're learning and what's difficult and what's feeling really right. It brings a lot of integrity to our at-home work, knowing that we're going to be sharing with other people in the class in that way. And I'll talk more about that next week, but I just wanna plant that seed for, um, yeah, it's kind of the shared uh, responsibility we have anyway for this class we're doing to show up on Monday nights whenever you can. We will record, we're recording now. So you can always listen to the recording if you have family business or you're sick or for whatever reason, it's not easy for you to be live on Monday night. And the other obligation is to do your practice, if not every day, almost every day, and not just the formal sitting practice, but to bring it up during the day and to do some study and to join in for the small groups. Now you may live with another Buddhist practitioner and you may create your own small group and that will be fine. But short of having your own opportunity, please plan on attending next, uh, at the end next Monday when we break into small groups. So the thing we usually do right at the beginning of class for those who are in your first Buddhist studies class is we chant the Buddha's refuges um, slowly, so not in a traditional way, but in a slower way. And of course, when we're all in the same room together, it's just a, a really nice activity to be doing the chant, singing together in this way. But it's a little different. You're just going to hear my voice, but I encourage you to chant along and I'll paste the chant right now in the chat so you can open up the chat if it isn't already open. And you see, you might be surprised, it's in the Pali language, which is one of the ancient languages of India, very similar to Sanskrit. And it's the language that the, <clears throat> this tradition, the early Buddhist tradition, the talks have been recorded um, in this language. And what this says is, um, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dhamma, I take refuge in the Sangha, and then it repeats three times. For the second time, I take refuge, etc., And then the last stanza for the third time. And it's, it's just part of coming together to do this study is that we're finding value in this base, the essence of the practice, which is I do deeply value being awake. Anybody in the group deeply value being asleep? I mean, we like sleep, it's healing, it's comfortable but it's not a strategy for being a wise and loving and happy human being like sleeping or being dull or being unclear. And Buddha in particular, when we take refuge in Buddha, we're really taking refuge in this capacity for wakefulness, for that capacity to be intimate, to see clearly, to feel deeply the way it is. And to basically go beyond our preconceived ideas or any conception whatsoever. And what do we do with that wakefulness? We're intimate with the way it is. That's Dhamma. That's the second refuge. So we're not taking refuge in something out there, something later down the road, something in the past. We're waking up to Buddha, waking up to Dhamma, what's here and now, the way it is here and now. 
And this is especially relevant with this course on mindfulness of the body, this exposure to the physicality of the body is just a basic strategy for being present. Like I am embodied, there is a body here. Does it really make sense for me to live this life disconnected, unaware of the body? Because that's kind of what we do a lot of the time. We use our busyness to justify not really being aware of the body. So we take refuge in Buddha, being awake, the Dhamma, the second refuge, the way it is, the changing nature phenomena coming and going, sensation, thought, emotion, bodily activity, mental activity. And finally, we take refuge in Sangha, which is the, the kind of activity we can express, the way we can engage our lives when we're being intimate, when Buddha is knowing Dhamma, then Sangha is a possibility for us. And in any moment, any one of us can have moments of being Sangha. It just means that how we're showing up, what we're saying or not saying, even what we're thinking or not thinking is really an expression or coming, arising out of that, the integrity of that intimacy of Buddha knowing Dhamma. It's really hard to be a, kind and wise human being if we're not deeply connected with the way it is. And that means deeply connected isn't just the depth, subtlety of awareness, but it's also the breadth of awareness and the continuity of awareness that gives us the capacity to actually show up in this world in more and more skillful ways. And that's really what the word Sangha points to, this awakened activity, awakened engagement, wise and kind engagement in the world, in our lives. So let's do this chant slowly. Please join in or just listen to me do the chanting if for some reason you're afraid of chanting or singing at home, <laughs> be brave. And just do your best with the pronunciation, you'll get it. So I'll ring the bell three times to begin. Tatiampi 
Sangang Saranang Kachami. And taking some time, and especially tonight at the beginning of the course and the course on mindfulness of the body, cultivating, really listening into the posture. It's not so much trying to have the bodily posture fit some idea. It's more about this long-term wish to listen and respond to the body so that we're finding our way how to compose the body in a way that is supportive, in a way that feels energizing, as opposed to sitting in a way that supports dullness, in a way that feels releasing and comfortable instead of a way that causes pain. And in a relaxed way, taking a couple of longer and deeper breaths, and that can help you cultivate a intimate presence with the body. Making more subtle adjustments that support both the relaxation and the alertness. And be really pragmatic about how you're sitting. So what sitting in what way really supports meditation, clarity and relaxation. And then before you actually Imagine that you're meditating, just notice that there's awareness of the body already without anybody doing anything. Notice that the body is being known, the sitting body, the breathing body, And really let this sink in that the awareness is already here. Bodily awareness is already here. And being interested specifically now in any sensations in the head, top of the head, including the way to the hair and perhaps feeling, sensing the skull and any pressure in the head that you might be aware of. All the muscles especially around the face, the brow, around the eyes, the jaw. And simply aware of the air touching the skin of the face, cool or warm. Notice the sensations of the tongue, the lips, perhaps feeling the eyelids touching the eyes.
And for a few more seconds, a simple and kind, tender awareness of the entire face and head. Not needing any of these sensations to be different or other than how they are now in the head and face. Just appreciating the wholesome qualities of mind that are already beginning to show up, maybe some patience and the wholesome quality of interest, clarity. Just accepting, allowing all these sensations in the head and face to be the way they are. And you'll notice the sensations as a kind of movement. Feeling the sensations now along the sides of the neck. No need to try to fix anything, just feeling what's there. Back of the neck. Real curiosity, a simple wholesome desire to be intimate, to feel whatever feeling is here at the back of the neck. And eventually the throat, the front side of the neck. And not afraid of tension or any unpleasantness you might encounter. Just be willing to receive and to relax with whatever's showing up. And we take some time and let the attention soak into the tops of the shoulders. So from the sides of the neck, awareness settles into the tops of the shoulders all the way to the shoulder joints. So mostly now we're just practicing being interested in these different places in the body. We're not trying to do anything or fix anything. Simply feeling here at the top of the shoulders, whatever's here to feel. And allowing things to be. And of course, things may change. The quality of the sensations may change, but we're not trying to make them change. And there's really a sense of kindness in this patient and steady interest. Now feeling down both arms, feel the clothes, the sleeves touching the skin. And the underarms and the bend of the elbows, so all the different aspects as you feel down both arms. It's the ordinary movement of sensation here. Including the back of the hands. Including all the fingers and palms. The wrists.
So in a fresh way, as if you're feeling both arms and hands for the first time. Actually curious about that movement of sensation here. In no hurry, be happy to be present here forever. So take a few seconds and just sense how the awareness is still quite accessible here in the head and face and throat and neck and shoulders in both arms. And we feel the collarbones and the top of the rib cage. And we take some time to let the awareness get established here, realizing simply these sensations are being felt, being known, letting them be, including the ordinary sensation in the upper chest and upper back of the clothes, the shirt against the skin. Maybe some movement of the expansion and contraction due to the breathing process. And of course, any tension you might feel, especially in the upper back, down through the shoulder blade area and the upper spine, down the breastbone, perhaps some movement in the lungs and perhaps some movement in the heart, feeling the beating. Just see what's available here in the middle of the chest in the shoulder blade area. And then down to the lower ribs, front and back and sides of the ribs, diaphragm, solar plexus, kidneys. No hurry. And we're dropping any expectation of what it is we should be feeling and simply receiving whatever sensations are showing up. Even if at times it feels like not much of anything and that's what you're feeling, that's fine. The key is to learn how to be interested, curious, without projecting something onto the experience. It's a very receptive mode. And down into the abdomen and down into the lower back, taking your time, Buddha knowing Dhamma, being awake to the way it is here in the abdomen and lower back, including the entire structure of the pelvis and the groin and the floor of the pelvis, sits bones. Take it all in. The 
without ignoring places that might be painful, make sure to include them, those places as well. Everything belongs. Feeling the whole trunk, both arms, both shoulders, the neck and head and face. So the upper half of the body alive with sensation. And again, notice how simple it is to have a kind attitude, patient attitude. One of the things, one of the really important lessons we learn by cultivating mindfulness of the body is how functional patience and kindness is. It really helps, it really works. And it's quite natural when we're aware to become more and more kind and patient. And feeling the hip sockets and the sits bones. Let's begin to feel down both legs. Whatever you're feeling, simply open with curiosity, allowing the sensations here to be the way they are. Noticing any touch points in the thighs. And again, no hurry. including the clothes, the pants, touching the skin. Feeling now the bend of the knees and any sensations there, any touch points around the knees. The kneecaps, down the shins. And around to the backside, feel the calves. And down through the ankles. Feeling down to the heels, any contact. The sides and tops of both feet now. And just simply receiving the sensations at the bottom of the feet. Interest and kindness toward the toes, whatever's here. Noticing the simple, ordinary experience. Are the toes cold or warm? Constricted, pressed together, or expansive? And feeling both legs together, both feet and legs together. And then the whole body from the head to the toes, inside, outside, front and back, sides. Mm, feeling this integration 
this kind and generous presence receiving all the movement of bodily sensations, nothing left out. almost as if the body were being bathed by the mind, drenched, immersed in this enlivened, kindly awareness. And just let the body rest, this immersion, And we appreciate the flow, the continuous flow of sensation. And even those places in the body that might feel quite hard or set, fixed. When we bring that open, that receptive awareness, we begin to notice that all places are alive with change. The very nature of sensation to move to flow. So let's take five minutes of silence and just do your best to practice keeping this flow of sensation in mind. There's no right or wrong way. Sometimes it might be a specific sensation that's predominant. In other moments, it will be the whole body together. Remember, it's really good, okay to relax. No tension is really needed. Just keeping the body in mind.
we are getting to know a very particular effort to keep the body in line. This kind, interested presence. Go ahead and <clears throat> adjust your posture. So over the course of the eight weeks, we'll be doing different meditations. But for the first week or so, really keep it simple. And uh, freshness is really important. So after you have some time to compose yourself, whether you want to practice with your eyes open or closed, then like we did tonight, before you direct your attention, before you try to meditate, just sitting there until you notice that awareness of the body is already happening. Now we can distract ourselves from this sensitivity to the body. Like I was saying, it's really one of the greater tragedies in our human lives is that we spend so much time disconnected from the body, the embodied experience. It's as if, you know, we have a human life and our strategy for being a happy human being is to be disconnected <laughs> from our life. It doesn't really make sense, but we do have this capacity to be lost in thought. And in being lost in thought, being identified with the thinking process and the meaning that the thinking is constructing, we can be oblivious. But even when we're oblivious to the body, the mind, the heart is sensitive to the body. It's just not in view. So at the beginning of a sit, without trying to meditate, just allow that sensitivity of the body in a sense to reemerge. Oh, there is a knowing mind, a sensitive heart, sensitive to the body. This is already here and now. And it's really, it, it's because part of, one of the biggest part of the Buddhist teachings on mindfulness of body is actually not so much about being mindful of the body, but transforming the mind's understanding, how the mind understands this, this, you know, experience of the present moment. And so we want to, <clears throat> we want to uproot some very deep old habits, like there isn't a body unless I go, I go and put my attention on it. 
So that would be the first thing that I'd recommend is just uh, as often as you can during the day and then at the beginning of the sit and then as many times during the sit when you're totally lost in thought, but then come back, just be patient and notice how the awareness of the body returns. Distraction fades, awareness of embodiment returns. And in some ways, you know, as we're practicing and studying the Buddhist teachings on mindfulness of the body, the body and the world are kind of the same thing, you know, and we get lost and we're not just disconnected from the body, but we're disconnected from the world. We may think we're dealing with the world, but we're, we're just in our thoughts about it. So this uh, using mindfulness of the body is a way back to being real as opposed to being unreal. And then once, once you allow the awareness of the body to reemerge, and there's that very ordinary, but also profound, oh, there's a body here. Embodiment is like this. Embodiment is being known, being felt. And, that, and you'll know that partly because there'll be a little bit of freedom from the mental construct of the body. Of course, well, the thoughts about the body, the thoughts about my body, all that mental activity, of course, is still going to be being generated. That's okay. Don't be, we're not, the practice isn't about repressing the thinking mind. That's a futile endeavor. <laughs> But just let the thoughts about the body be there. But we want to rediscover that, that the, the reality of embodiment and the sensitivity to the body. And only then you can pick up some strategies. Like tonight, we did a body scan. And then, you know, where we're directing the attention to places in the body, like we did the head. And we're just keeping in mind the, the attitude of patience and kindness, sort of holding space. And then the, the more nuanced and subtle reality of the sensation in the head and face just comes into view. It's not so much that we've got to have the awareness penetrate into the skull or into the eyeballs or things like that. It's more that the reality of the head and face, the sensations, they just start showing up in the space of awareness. And that's the real flip. Instead of thinking there's a me, like a searchlight, shining my awareness on the body, that's the diluted view. But when you actually observe your subjective experience, you'll see that the sensations, like when the intention is to be aware of the head and face, like we did at the beginning of the body scan. So you're setting that intention. I'm interested in feeling the sensations in the head and face. And you're patient and you're kind, which just means you're not there to judge. You're not there to fix. You're just curious. And then you'll notice sensations in the head and face, and you'll recognize that they're being known here and now, being felt here and now. And, you know, we say, you don't have to say it to yourself, but we say, oh yeah, they're being known in the space of the knowing mind or in the space of the sensitive heart, whatever you like. But those are just words. Our subjective experiences, they're being known here and now in the present moment, in the space of the present moment. So we just sort of hang out. And when you're hanging out in each place, notice that the sensations are here and now, notice that they're alive with change. It isn't, because that really helps the mind or wisdom make the distinction between my concept, the idea of the head and face, and the actual movement of sensation. 
to feel the dynamic changing nature, right? And then the other thing to notice before you move on to the next place in the body is just some of the beautiful or wholesome qualities of mind. I mentioned, I think in the guide, it said like, notice how much more patience is there. Notice how the mind is naturally interested in being intimate, how there's a lot of energy, not dullness, how there may be even some joy. Maybe there's some tranquility and stillness and real balance, like equanimity. I, I'm neither for nor against anything. There's nobody for or against anything. The mind, the heart is really balanced. Those are the awakening factors. And we'll keep returning to them through all the weeks, but they're basically wholesome, energizing factors of the mind and wholesome, tranquilizing, calming factors of mind. And we'll just, they'll just start naturally showing up. And we want to notice that it actually is, it's a real empowerment to see these beautiful qualities just start showing up because it really helps undermine this heavy idea that can creep into our spiritual practice and our meditation practice, which is some version of the idea, I have to do it. I have to be calm. I have to be alert. I have to connect with experience. And, you know, the basic premise and really the insight that the Buddha points to is that it's all happening on its own. So, and then you move to the next place and you can do it in any, you know, generally top to bottom, and then you can go bottom up, back up, depending on how much time you have. But, you know, what we did tonight is fine, just go top to bottom and then go to whole body awareness. And even in that whole body awareness, if you like working with the breath, you can use the breath almost like a metrodone when you're playing music, you know, the keeping the beat with each inhalation. It's like a nice interval as you're breathing in to just, um, in a sense, reassert the interest to be intimate with the whole body. And then as you're feeling the breath going out, it's just like a cue for the heart to remember its intention to receive, to keep that in mind. Because that's the effort. The effort isn't in directing the attention to the body. The effort is in remembering there's a knowing mind or a sensitive heart already knowing sensitive to the body, to the movement of sensation, that that's already here and now. So the effort that needs to be made, the persistent effort is keeping the body in mind. Oh yeah, this is being known. Just like through the day, we're gonna keep in mind when we're reaching that reaching is being known. And it's not like you gotta say those words in your mind when you're reaching for the light switch reaching is being known, but you can. But the idea is to be so here and now that it's apparent that there's a body and there's sensitivity to the body. Both are nature. Neither one of them requires a practitioner, a person to be the body or a person to know the body. Both the knowing and the body or the activity of nature. So as a practitioner, our task is more specific. It's to keep it in mind. Sati, the word for mindfulness, it's really derived from remembering. We're remembering to recognize the present moment. Oh, this is being known. And the body is, you know, obviously the more concrete aspect of the present moment the visceral, you know, dynamic of what's here and now. So just to review, just to kind of give you something, and of course you'll have the recording from tonight, you can go back to, and there are many uh, great guided meditations on mindfulness of the body, but they'll be different. And like I said, we'll probably end up doing, you know, five or six different meditations during these eight weeks. 
So you'll get lots of different strategies. But for the first couple of weeks, keep it really simple. Sit down, compose the body, and then just wait until there's that simple recognition. You know what? The body's being known. Without me doing anything, awareness of the sitting body, the breathing body, awareness of sensation is already here and now. Interesting that I didn't have to do that. Can I keep this in mind? Well, here's a simple strategy to keep in mind because it keeps the mind interesting, interested. I'll do a body scan, right? And then, like I said, just direct your attention, choose a, you know, a place in the body that you're gonna bring your attention, really notice those values of patience and kindness and brightness, real interest and they just start showing up. You don't have to impose them. Notice the wholesome qualities that start to show up. Notice how, whatever experience you're being aware of, how with patience and continuity, the mind just starts to experience more and more. It kind of comes alive. And this is important because once we get a taste for it, we don't wanna go back to being disconnected even though it can be quite unpleasant to feel the body. Most people, once they've gotten some real taste of being present, nobody really consciously chooses to be numb and disconnected and unaware. We get into that habit. It's sort of, uh, you know, when we're hurting, when the body's tight, contracted, mind's tight and contracted, it seems to make sense to go towards oblivion and, you know, distraction. But it's done because the mind or wisdom doesn't understand the cost of being disconnected. Like a, the deeply provocative statement the Buddha said, you know, something like mindfulness is... Uh, the path to the deathless, to awakening, to freedom, to enlivened release of the heart. Those who are negligent, those who aren't vigilant, those who aren't practicing being mindful, who aren't remembering it's like this, they are as if already dead. That's, that's a little shocking. And then when we're living a relatively disconnected life, lost in our thoughts, disconnected, not aware, not having too many moments during the day. Oh, there's a body here and it's tight. <laughs> and I care about that, right? And then to sustain that. So without a lot of that, we start feeling appropriately disconnected and flat and depressed and and so the mind becomes more and more dependent on intensity in order to feel alive. So we start putting cayenne pepper in our food and watching horror films and decide to have an affair. And, you know, we start doing things so we, we don't feel dead. Like the Buddha says, when we're negligent, when we're not intimate with the body, with life, we feel as if we're already dead. So then we get the mind, we start to get addicted to anything that kind of stirs the pot. And then we get a world like this, right? Both externally and then within our own, each of our own lives, you know, our addictive, our various addictions, unhealthy, unhelpful addictions to intensity, eating more food, watching more media than we need, than is helpful. And it's not that, you know, anybody wise person would be against doing fun things. It's not like uh, to behoo fun things or exciting things, but the dependence, the neurotic dependence, right? And then you always have to up the ante. Isn't that the case? It's like, okay, I had one truffle but one truffle just doesn't do it. We had some truffles around. <laughs> They're gone now. <laughs> you know, or 
a little bit of news. Oh, but a it could, something else could have happened. Better check it again, maybe a little bit more news. And on and on like that. So then at the end, you know, when you've done, gone the body scan through the whole body, then just opening to the, I mean, move through all the parts and then whole body. And, um, and get really interested at that point in that wise effort. Like uh, if the effort isn't uh, intention, intentional enough or strong enough, then the mind will slip into thought. If the mind's trying too hard and the effort kind of has a self-centeredness to it, I'm trying to be connected with the body, then we'll miss it too. So that keeping the body in mind, that can actually be the theme when you're in the whole body, the totality of the sitting body. Remember, you can use the rhythm of the breathing in and out to support that continuity. So each time you're breathing in, it's like a little cue. Oh yeah, feeling aware of the whole body. Whole body is being known. But in any case, it's a, like a very, it, it will provoke some real interest. Like, oh, why is it so hard to keep the totality of the body in mind? The sitting body, the breathing body, the movement of sensation. Why is that so hard? So don't beat yourself up when you get distracted. Just get right back on the saddle, like, like you did right at the beginning. Just be patient. Oh yeah, here's the body again because it will return. You don't have to run back. You don't have to like drag your awareness back to the body. That misunderstands the nature of the body and the mind. When we feel like as a practitioner, because I've been distracted, I need to take the awareness and bring it back to the body. So when you notice you've been lost in thought, then just be appreciative that you noticed and notice there's a feeling tone of having been lost in thought. So you can even ask yourself if you need the prompt, what does it feel like? What is the embodied experience of having been lost in thought? That's already here and now without awareness or me or anybody going anywhere or doing anything. It's just the interest. What's it like having been lost in thought? Ah, and you're right back in your embodied experience. Oh, there's a body here. And that body is, of course, naturally reflecting everything. The body and mind are always reflecting each other. It's right here. So then you're back. And then you're that curiosity about like, can I keep this embodied reality in mind? Can I practice not forgetting? What's just the right like uh, tone of persistence? How do I find that right note to keep the body in mind, to not forget? Not too much, not too little. And that will really help then when the sit, the formal sit is over and you're going about your day because what's really gonna help is what we learn about persistence. And if you don't like that word, just find another one because some words will be, you know, provoke the wrong kind of efforting and you'll be tight. And then you won't, it won't last long because you'll get tired and it will get brittle and unpleasant. And so you're gonna to wanna to stop it. <laughs> so, the persistence that the Buddha, the kind of effort the Buddha is pointing to is the kind of effort you can sustain all day long because it's, it's not a hard thing to keep something in mind. It's just not the habit of the mind, but it can become the habit of the mind, but we need to be interested in it. And it's the interest that builds the interest, the continuity, like valuing, really getting a sense that being in the body is a good thing. Being out of the body, being unaware of the body is stressful 
and makes it harder to come back to the body because where does the stress get laid down? On the body. <laughs> so one of the reasons we don't want to live in an embodied way is <clears throat> the body is expressing all those moments we were disconnected and laying down layers of stress and tension. And so when we do come back, well, of course, we're going to feel what it feels like to have mostly been disconnected for as long as we've been disconnected. Of course, it doesn't feel good. But to continue to live in a disconnected way is just digging the hole deeper. It's just going to be harder. You know, and um, I think the skillful way to use the Buddhist teachings on rebirth or just, it was really just part of the culture at the time of the Buddha is like in a pragmatic way, not to believe it or to not believe it, but given that it's a possibility that there's rebirth, because who knows, right? Is it a, is it a, how can it be a skillful thing to bring in mind? Well, in this way, I think in this particular way is one example like, like we might think, you know, it's really hard to be in my body because it doesn't feel good. And, you know, I'm 62. It's probably too late to change my habit. I'm just going to try to ride this out being disconnected from my body, try to get to the end of this life and then I'll be done. So, you know, pragmatically or, uh, just in terms of what's skillful, bringing to mind that you might pick up where you left off in your next life, and you might have even a deeper habit of living in a disembodied way. And it will be harder to break the habit. So we know what it's like. I mean, all of us have had our own version of some addictive pattern in our life. And, you know, we let it go. We thought, oh, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. And finally, when we realize, you know what, it's a big deal, I need to stop doing this. And we realize that's it's so easy to change habits. So this is the thing we want to be in it for the long haul. And just on an intellectual level, it doesn't make sense to have a body and to not be intimate with it. The body has so much, it's like such a powerful feedback mechanism. It really tells us how to live. I mean, on, on a lot of levels, like, oh, that's hot. I shouldn't be touching it. But, but even more importantly, it reflects the mind. It's so hard to know what's going on in the mind. But if we're intimate with the body, we, we know a lot more about the mind. When the mind is tight, the body tightens. So any questions about the uh, meditation instructions uh, before I go on? I want to say a few more things, but, um, and why don't you go ahead and use, if you don't know how, I think you can raise your hand in a couple places. You can raise it under participants, and you can also raise your hand under reactions. So if you open the participant screen at the bottom, usually there's a place that says, can raise your hand. Otherwise, under reactions, there's a, a lot of us. So this will help me see who's raising their hand. Any questions about the guided meditation or how to meditate for the next few weeks that are coming to mind? Good, I don't see any hands. I hope that's a good sign. And uh, so then uh, one thing I'll put in the email tomorrow is uh, there's two main discourses from the Buddha that we'll use in the course. One is the Satipatthana Sutta, and uh, especially of course, the section on mindfulness of the body. And then there's another discourse um, that is Let's see how it's translated here. It's the in Pali, it's the Kaya Gati, the pa, the Kaya Gata Sati Sutta, mindfulness immersed in the body. And um, 
the, the first part is really just about sort of what we're doing tonight and for the first couple of weeks, which is just having um, the body as a kind of mindfulness anchor, both in our formal sitting time, but then all day long. So there's the breath and the physicality of the breathing, breathing process that can bring us back to the present moment. There's the uh, totality of the body. So when we're moving about, it's every movement. And there are the postures. So that when we're standing, there can be a simple reflective awareness. Oh yeah, standing's like this. When we're sitting, there's an awareness of sitting. When we're lying down, there's that awareness. When we're moving or walking, there's that awareness. So this, these, uh, I want to read you these two passages, and I'll, I'll uh, paste them in the email so you'll have them. Um, and the whole sutta is part of that resource page that you'll get the link for. So I won't read the part about uh, awareness of the in and out breath. And then so the second practice, after the breathing practice in the sutta, the Buddha says, furthermore, when walking, the practitioner discerns, I am walking. When standing, one discerns, I am standing. When sitting, one discerns, I am sitting. When lying down, one discerns, I'm lying down. Or however this body is disposed, that is how one discerns it. And if one remains thus heedful, ardent and resolute, any memories and resolves related to the worldly life, which is kind of Buddhist code for greed, anger, and delusion, you know, relating with greed, anger, and delusion, right, are abandoned. And with their abandoning, one's mind gathers and settles inwardly, grows unified and centered. This is how a practitioner develops mindfulness immersed in the body. So we can just try it. Most of us are sitting now. So even as you're listening, you know, and maybe seeing, isn't it possible for this sustained awareness? Sitting is like this, just awareness of the posture. And interestingly, learning how to be really intimate with sitting, this awareness of sitting, it doesn't actually make you distracted or unaware of like what I'm saying. And this is, this teaches us, I mean, this is, you know, part of the reason mindfulness of the body is so helpful. Because one of the things it reveals is the present moment is a is one thing for lack of a, I mean, it's not the most articulate way to describe it. You know, we, we talk about the diversity of experience because there are sights and there are sounds and there are touches and there are smells and tastes and there are thoughts and other mental activities. It seems incredibly diverse because even within the one field like visual field, there are so many aspects of my visual experience. Same with the auditory, same with the touch, smell and taste, same with the mental world, the mental activity world. It's quite diverse. But it's all here and now. There's something about the present moment that it has this nature of collected here and now. So when we're using this awareness of posture and we've made it a good friend, really developed it, built some momentum with the posture, then it's like the intimacy just naturally goes towards every other aspect of experience, like the emotional life and the mental life and the visual life and the auditory life. So this isn't meant, this mindfulness of the body isn't in the direction of an exclusive attention. So we're focusing on some sensation in the body 
and completely oblivious to everything else. It's really more about how to come into the totality of the present moment. So here's a second passage that I <clears throat> recommending that we work with this next week. So first was just the four postures. And then the second one is, is usually described as daily activities. And it goes like this. Furthermore, when going forward and returning, one makes oneself fully alert. When looking toward and looking away, when bending and extending one's limbs, when carrying one's outer cloak, one's upper robe and bowl, right? So anything you might be carrying, that's what the monastics carry. When eating, drinking, chewing and savoring, when urinating and defecating, when walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep, waking up, talking, remaining silent, one makes oneself fully alert. And as one remains thus heedful, ardent and resolute, any memories and resolves related to the worldly life of greed, anger, delusion are abandoned. And with their abandoning, one's mind gathers and settles inwardly, grows unified and centered. This is how a practitioner develops mindfulness immersed in the body. So as we near the end of tonight's class, you might, we might even want to think together about, well, how am I going to remember to do this? You know, and so you might just get creative. Like some of the th ways that I've done this in the past is I'll just have a little note. I'll write on a, like a post-it and I'll keep it in my pocket. You know, it could be mindfulness of posture or mindfulness of daily activities. Whenever my hand goes to my pocket, I remember it's a little prompt, but you can put it little notes around your house or your office or wherever you might see them. And just know that it might trigger that parental shaming or whatever, I'm not a good Buddhist or whatever energy in you, depending on your personality type. Or if you're a rebel, it might be, you can't, I can't tell myself what to do, you know, and you might be dismissive of the prompt. So just find a way to prompt yourself in a way that will actually be conducive to being curious. Oh yeah, because it's, it's not a big deal. You're not, no one's asking us to change our life or it's just like that little effort of remembering. See, we're not changing what, how we're doing stuff. You just do stuff the way you want to do stuff. We're just bringing this little effort to remember that the sensitive heart, the knowing mind is already sensitive, already knowing bodily sensations. It's already happening, but we're not remembering that it's happening because the mind hasn't been trained to value mindfulness immersed in the body. So really it's about values. We're valuing this intimacy with the body. So how are we gonna prompt ourselves? How are we gonna remember and grow that value? This is important. There is actually a place for being like using wholesome fear or wholesome concern. Like, do I, like, what would it mean to get better and better at not being aware of the body? And is this what I want for this life? And I think, I hope the resonant answer is no. You know, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. How could that be good? to be here, but not connected, to be embodied, but not aware. This is a, <clears throat> a quote I really like from uh, Joko Beck. Some of you might remember or have read some of her books. Uh, she was a Zen teacher, um, mostly teaching in uh, San Diego, just outside of San Diego, I think. And uh, for many years, she died a while back. And I'm not sure of which of her two books this is from, 
um, that it's her teaching, her little teaching about the end to our substitute life. So what she calls our worldly life, our life of greed, anger, and delusion, and mostly being caught up in our thoughts about things, lost in thought. She refers to that as our substitute life. So here's her concluding paragraphs in this chapter uh, about the end to our substitute life. So the secret of life that we are all looking for is just this, to develop through sitting and daily life practice, the power and courage to return to that which we have spent a lifetime hiding from, to rest in the bodily experience of the present moment, even if it is a feeling of being humiliated, of failing, <clears throat> Excuse me. Even if it is a feeling of being humiliated, a failing of abandonment, of unfairness, we learn to rest in our experience without thought, to sink into a non dual state. Even if we can stay only a few seconds at first, with time and development, we can learn to rest there for long periods of time. As we rest in this non-duality, <clears throat> we leave behind the phenomenal world of problems and dualistic solutions. We start with including and clarifying our psychological world but we end in a transformation that cannot be really described in words. We can only suggest a way of living that is free, compassionate, functional. And in this way, our so-called problems can be dealt with in a more open and compassionate manner. Call this enlightenment if you wish, but please remember, we do not do this bodily experiencing just once or in one sitting. We are describing a lifetime process with many ups and downs, probably one that is never complete. It doesn't matter. What does matter is the slow, slow shift in the way we see and live our lives. This is the end to our substitute life. So let this be our homework. Uh, the formal sitting that I described, that very simple using the body scan and then moving to the whole body awareness and getting really interested in sustaining, keeping in mind the awareness of the body. And then during the rest of the day, when you're not in your formal sit, just use postures and daily activities to keep bringing you back and get creative with how you're going to prompt yourself. And I'll send that stuff out sometime in the middle of the day tomorrow. So you'll get that email. And if you don't get the email, it means you're not in the email list. And then you can send Gabe or send Common Ground just a note saying, I'm in the Buddhist studies class, but I'm not getting the emails and we'll get it to you. Uh, Gabe or I will make sure you get it. And then I also sent a couple articles, one by Gil Fronstel that uh, is pretty short, but I think is quite good as an introduction to the work we're doing. And another one is by another Zen teacher, Darlene Cohen, who's passed away recently. But next week, I wanna talk more about physical pain. And uh, she has a useful article and I'll send some more resources out around physical pain that some of you might have time to read and, and will really benefit from if you do have time. So make sure that uh, you're getting on the email list. So again, if you don't get an email from me by tomorrow uh, afternoon, late afternoon, then probably you're not on the email list. So let me know. And hi, I'll stay on if you have a question, unless it's for the whole group. Um, but wishing everybody a good night. Hope to see you next Monday. We'll have small groups at the last part of next Monday's class. Have a good week, everybody.